Mesh analysis is a technique in which we use loops of a circuit and KVL to determine the current in each loop. The most effective way to select your loops is the window method. Look at the planar circuit as a bunch of windows. Each window is a loop. Although some use the clockwise convention, I just like to select loops based on how I predict the current is most likely to go. For example, in this bottom left loop, I think that the current is going to go this way. So I'll set that one to be I1. I also think that in this loop, the current will go in this way. So I'll select that to be I2. Probably the current in this one will go, I'm just going to say clockwise as well. So it turns out I use the clockwise convention for this circuit, but I don't always do it. You may be asking, Jonan, that's strange. Why is there an I2 going through 4 ohms in this direction and an I3 going through 4 ohms in this direction? Shouldn't there just be one current going through the 4 ohm resistor? Why have you said that there's two? Circuits have a property we call linearity. Linearity basically means you can add together different effects on the same branch or the same node or the same resistor linearly. So if you have two different currents that you think are going through a resistor, they're really just adding up to one current. You've taken the current that goes through the resistor and you've split it up into two different currents. So through this 4 ohm resistor, we can pretend that whatever current it's made of is actually made of a combination of two currents. I3, which is the current that happens to go through this 2 ohm branch, and I2, which is the current that happens to go through this 5 amp branch. It's worth noting that the current in this branch is only I2. It is not I3 or I1 or any combination. According to our choice of loop, the current through this branch is I2. Incidentally, because the current through this branch is forced to be 5 amps by this current producer, that means that I2 is actually equal to 5 amps. You can probably guess that I1 is therefore equal to 10 amps. How nice, we've already figured out the current in two of the meshes. It seems like I've picked an easy example, deliberately. Now this doesn't mean that the current through the 4 ohm resistor is 5 amps, it just means that part of the current through the resistor is 5 amps in the left direction. I3 also contributes some current to the 4 ohms in the opposite, probably the opposite direction. To determine what I3 is, it's time to use KVL. I'm going to assign convenient voltage terminals to each of these resistors, and I will call their voltages V6, V4, and V2. To write KVL, we need to go through the loop in the clockwise direction as selected. I'm going to start from this point, and we can use whichever convention we desire. The convention I like to use is that if I go from a positive to a negative terminal, I write the voltage between those terminals as a negative drop. So we go negative V6, negative V4, and negative V2 equals zero. Now the question is, what is V6, V4, and V2? Clearly these are way too many unknowns, but remember in our previous lectures we talked about the idea of converting a voltage into a current in case doing that actually helped. And we can do that using Ohm's law. We just need to determine what the current is that produces V6. Now you can see that there are two currents passing through the 6 ohm resistor. There's I3, which travels from the positive to the negative terminal, and I1, which travels from the negative to the positive terminal. If a current travels from the positive to the negative terminal, that means that we can treat the voltage drop as positive. That is, this magnitude, or this V right here, is positive. This negative sign in KVL is from KVL. The voltage itself has its own sign, and the sign of the voltage itself is determined by its terminals. Because I3 passes from the positive to the negative terminal, the contribution of I3 to V6 is simply I3 times 6 ohms. That is a positive contribution. I1, however, goes in the opposite direction. I1 goes from the negative to the positive terminal on the 6 ohm resistor. So we are going to describe its effect on the voltage drop across the resistor as a negative effect. Why and what does that mean? Remember that I1 and I3 are basically going to add together to represent the total current through the 6 ohm resistor. So I3 should produce a voltage drop, but I1, because it's in the opposite direction, will reduce the amount of current going in the direction of I3. So we can write this amount of reduction linearly. 
That is, we say that I1 reduces the total voltage drop that I3 provided. So I3 provides an I3 times 6 voltage drop, but I1 reduces that voltage drop by I1 times 6. That is why it is negative. So if the current goes from negative to positive, we say it has a negative effect on the voltage drop. And if the current goes from positive to negative, it has a positive effect on the voltage drop. And again, this voltage V between the positive and negative terminals is a drop, but we call it positive. It's a positive drop. If it were a rise, we would call it negative. Once again, V4 is equal to I3 goes from positive to negative, so it causes a positive drop of I3 times 4 ohms. I2 goes from the negative to the positive, so it reduces the voltage drop due to I3 by I2 times, oh, messed up my 2, times 4 ohms. Finally, V2 occurs solely due to I3. I3 goes from positive to negative, and so it produces a voltage drop in that direction. Remember that we've decided it's a voltage drop by convention. If we found out that I3 was going in the other direction, it would be causing a voltage rise in the direction that we chose for the terminals. It is just a convention to call this a voltage drop. Anyway, we can now plug these things into KVL. It's convenient to write this as 6 ohms times I3 minus I1 for reasons we'll see shortly. Thus, this term is 4 times I3 minus I2. Let's plug this into the equation, turning everything into pluses. V6 becomes 6 I3 minus I1. V4 becomes 4 I3 minus I2. And V2 becomes 2 I3, and this all equals 0. We'll plug in I1 and I2 to get 6 I3 minus 6 times 10, plus 4 I3 minus 4 times 5, um, plus 2 I3. You can see I've distributed the 4s out and the 6s out, and I replaced I1 and I2. This results in 12 I3 minus 60 minus 20 equals 0. 12 I3 equals 80. I3 equals 80 over 12. For the purposes of the discussion, I'm going to write I1 as 120 over 12 and I2 as 60 over 12. That's just fraction changing. Let's determine what the voltages are at each of these points if the ground is here to confirm that we've done this correctly. Confirmation is an important part of doing a circuit well. V6 is of course equal to 6 ohms times I3 minus I2, I1. 80 minus 120 is negative 40 over 12. The 6 and the 12 cancel out to be over 2, so we get negative 20 volts for V6. How do we interpret this? If this is a 0 volts and V6 were positive 20, that would mean that the positive terminal is 20 volts higher than the negative terminal, so this would be negative 20. But because it's actually negative 20 volts for V6, the negative terminal is higher than the positive terminal. It's a rise, so this must be 20 volts. Let's determine the voltage rise across V2. I mean, V2 is going to be a voltage drop, but we see that whatever V2 is, we're going to rise by that amount. V2 is I3 times 2 ohms. That's 80 over 12 times 2, which is 40 over 3 volts. That's equal to V2. Now the moment of truth. Is V4 going to rise by 20 over 3, which would make this 60 over 3, which would be 20? V4 equals 4 times I3 minus I2, 80 minus 60, is 20 over 12. 4 and 12 cancel out to be 20 over 3 volts. If you add 20 over 3 volts to 40 over 3, you get 60 over 3, which is 20. So you solve this circuit correctly.